Hello. Uh, it's hello. 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 Hello there. <laughs> Welcome back to the Space School. Today we'll do what would have happened had Darth Vitiate returned during the Clone Wars. Before we begin this video, special thanks to our Patreons, voice actors, and everyone else a part of my team. You want a chance to win a free lightsaber in the next giveaway? Watch the end of the video. I'll tell you exactly how you can win. Don't pay attention to the scammer in the comments. That's not me. That's a scammer. Our story begins at the height of the Clone Wars. One year into combat, the clone armies were finally able to make their push pushback against the armies of the Separatists. While the clones had leaders in Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, during the second year of combat, the clones were galaxy-wide able to make movements against the sinister opponents. It was much more effective than the two battalions that were led by, successfully, Kenobi and Skywalker. Out in the mid-rim, a movement in the Force was created, and through a hole created from hyperspace. It was a rare occurrence in the galaxy, having happened only once before, traveling through hyperspace accidentally opening up a wormhole, dragging the entire fleet of the Sith Emperor himself through to the year of 21 BBY. To the members of the Sith Emperor's army, it felt as if nothing had changed. They were moving through space. Their original goal was to wage war on a group of innocent civilians in an attempt to draw the Jedi from their Jedi Temple on Coruscant and then wipe them out. Vitiate decided that it wouldn't be a sound idea to just invade Coruscant openly, considering it was the most defendable position for the Jedi. This was the case during his time, and it was most certainly the case after his time. The Emperor's fleet moved in on the planet Ryloth. It had already been through a lot during this young war. Not too long before Obi-Wan Kenobi and the 212th marched down and saved the local population from being starved to death. Currently, Jedi Master Imogundi and his clone battalion held ground of Ryloth. No significant fleet was dedicated to Ryloth, considering it was close to Genosis, which was back under the control of the Sepis. The Galactic Republic and the Galactic Outer Front had widely spread out. The Republic had to sacrifice some systems to the idea of a possible Separatist invasion. Part of the reason was there weren't a dedicated fleet over Ryloth was because the Republic was working towards a second invasion of Genosis. With Vitiate's fleet arriving, the armies of the Sith Emperor rained down on the planet. It wasn't noticed considering most of the populated side of the planet was hidden under the cover of night. Vitiate sent down his three sons to lead the divisions of troops in the battle. The sons of Vitiate were named Arkan, Thexen, and Velin, and they were all about to lead the worst genocide the galaxy had ever seen in over a millennia. Vichier told his sons to make sure that there were no survivors of the invasion, and with his word, the work would begin. The sons of Vichier went down to Ryloth with their divisions and with the advantage of surprise, and they led an assault against the capital city. Currently, Omfri Ta and Cham Syndulla were inside of the capital with their clone army. When the sound of gunships dropping down to the surface and shortly after, the ringing of blaster fire awoke everyone. Captain Howitzer and Captain Keely awoke and looked outside of the barracks to see the execution of the Twi'leks in the streets. Howitzer ordered all of his men to their feet and into the streets to defend the civilians. By the time the clones got out of their barracks, the blaster fire had already made its way inside of the city gates. It was a mass execution. The clones rounded the corners with their shiny armor, having never seen combat. All of them shinies fresh from Kamino with no real combat experience. Howitzer decided to order his men to retrieve all the citizens and cover them. Cham Sandula came down with his guard, and right behind them was Jedi Master Umigundi. It was complete chaos, because this was seemingly a third faction in the Clone Wars. They weren't the Separatists, because even Separatist-aligned parents were not allowed to contribute a militia to the CIS army. The droids were more than enough, and there was also another defining characteristic. The armor of the troops was very historic. It was like a walking museum. A shell exploded near the group of commanders, as Hauser and Syndulla were separated from Imagundi and a group of clones that were with them. Screaming could be heard. The population of the people were running away as they were blasted down from behind. The Sons of Vitiate didn't hesitate either. Their lightsabers were yellow and they moved like blurs, learning from quite possibly the greatest Sith Lord of all time. Imagundi noticed this. He hadn't seen anyone other than Temple Guards use this color of lightsaber. Imagundi ordered two of his men to contact the Jedi Temple and the Republic for reinforcements. They would certainly need it. 
Moments later, Captain Keeley and Imagundi made a counter-offensive as they rushed into battle with the Sith Emperor's army. Imagundi came across Arkan in a massive lightsaber duel. Their blades clashed. Imagundi was a solid duelist, pushing Arkan back. Gundi asked during the heated exchange why the young man would ever serve Count Dooku. Arkane stood back and looked confusedly at Master D. Arcane straightened up, saying he served his father, the Sith Emperor. Imagundi's face was covered in shock. He couldn't believe it. The Sith they'd been looking for stood before him. Of course, to the Jedi, Vitiate would be the Sith they'd been looking for since the death of Qui-Gon Jinn. Imagundi had his comlink open, so it was transmitting the entire conversation to the clones who were in contact with the Jedi Temple. Imagundi stepped forward, his men rallied behind him, their weapons at the ready, and within a moment's notice, the other two brothers ignited their lightsabers and rained down from the skies. Thexen and Valen struck down the clone troopers while the armies of Vitiate moved in without hesitation. Imagundi cried out for his troops to get away, watching them get cut to pieces without even having a fighting chance. Imagundi ran forward and clashed with Arcane, colliding blades with the son of Vitiate once again. Their duel was ferocious as the armies of the Asith Emperor burnt the capital city to the ground. Imagundi was a terrific duelist, but it was only a matter of time before Arcane cut down the Jedi Master. When the duel was over, the capital city was in shambles. Clone troopers were being executed by the dozens as they laid their lives down for the survival of the Twi'leks. Cham Syndulla and Om Frita would both meet a terrible death at the hands of the Sons. Captain Keeley and Captain Hauser both died in the streets, covering their men running into the night lit by the flames of the Sith. When the battle was over, the Sith Emperor himself landed on the ground. Lord Vitiate watched the flames engulf the entire landscape, dispatching each of his sons to the various cities across Ryloth to burn them down. Vitiate knew the Jedi would be brought to face him, though what would come next would surprise him indefinitely. Vitiate waited in the middle of the city, sitting on a throne made of the ashes of a civilization. His vile nature showed through his actions and his devious thoughts stayed trapped inside of his mind until they saw the light of day in the death of billions. It would take time, but the Republic and the Separatists would both arrive out of hyperspace to confront the foe who ripped Ryloth apart. The Jedi were going there because well, they were Jedi, but the Separatists were sent by Sidious to figure out who it was to have this amount of power to just rip Ryloth to the ground. This power threatened Sidious' reign, or soon to be reign of the galaxy, so he wanted to get to the bottom of this mystery. Count Dooku's fleet would arrive out of hyperspace alongside the Republic fleet, led by the 187th and Master Windu. Before the Separatists or the Republic jumped into combat with each other, they noted that there were ships in front of them that hadn't been seen in over a millennia. Dooku and Windu were put into contact with each other, both of them admitting that they came to Ryloth to learn what it was that tore the entire civilization to the ground. While Windu didn't have time to ask Dooku or how he knew or how he came to learn about this incident, the two of them advised each other that they would become friends again just for the time being. They wouldn't try to kill each other, and their armies were not to fire on one another. Their fleets approached the fleet of the Sith Emperor, their weapons primed. Vitiate knew the Jedi would come, but the men inside of the vessels overhead reported to their Emperor that the fleets had technology not yet created. To Vitiate's surprise, he decided to use the tactical knowledge he had to order his fleet to move to the far side of the planet and prepare to take the troops off-planet to a hidden location. Vitiate ordered his sons and their divisions back to the main fleet to prepare a movement for another system. The main army he had with them would wait in the capital city and await for these fleets to dispatch their troops. It would take a couple of hours for the Republic and the Separatists to begin their landing sequences. Once they did, Dooku and Windu would meet on the front lines as temporary allies. When they saw the destruction, even Dooku was appalled. He couldn't believe the damage that had been done. He may have tried to starve the Twi'leks to get power over the Republic, but genocide was never his intention. What this was was absolutely horrific. The armies would march forward, Vitiate planned for an ambush. So when Dooku and Windu walked down the corridor, or what was left of the corridor in the main town, they were surprised to see an elderly man, shrouded in grey, sitting silently on a throne made from bodies that had been strewn across the battlefield. Dooku and Windu looked at each other, both gently stepping forward. The eyes of Lord Vitiate opened, and he didn't move a muscle. He just looked at them as they stopped in their tracks. Windu spoke first, demanding to know who he was. Vitiate grinned, before rising to his feet. 
He said he was a Sith Emperor Vitiate, Master of the Dark Side. Dooku knew this name by reputation and looked at Windu almost with fear in his eyes. Windu took notice of this, but before either of them could make a move or react, Vitiate reached out with his hands, and from Windu and Dooku, he stole something so precious to both of them. Vitiate used the dark side to drain their ability to use the force, completely stripping them from any abilities that made them so powerful. Both Dooku and Windu were great duelists, but now they no longer had the ability to use the force to give them any advantage in this battle. Vitiate, on the other hand, kept walking towards them menacingly. He raised his hand and snapped his finger. Behind Dooku and Windu, their armies were shot into a massive explosion. A booby trap laid below the armies of the Republic and the CIS. They were absolutely destroyed with no chance to survive. The 187th was filled with cries from the wounded and screams of terror, call-outs for medics and to take cover. The droid forces, on the other hand, were in chaos. From behind the smoke, blaster fire rained down on them. Dooku and Windu watched in horror. The two of them then turned around, ignited their lightsabers, and ran towards Vitiate. He didn't budge, nor did he move. He just watched them. When Windu and Dooku got closer, they swung. Vitiate twitched his finger, and Windu's blade and Dooku's blade crossed in front of Vitiate's face, not more than a centimeter, before they crushed into each other's blades. Vitiate still didn't move. Windu dragged his blade around, back, after avoiding hitting Dooku. The blade made its way towards Vitiate's face, and he refused to move again, but Windu's blade was stopped in its tracks. Even without the Force, Windu would have struggled to break through Vitiate's Force wall, but without even having access to the Force, he was stopped indefinitely. Vitiate reached his hand up, grabbing Windu's hand and shoving his blade back, cutting through Dooku's neck as he swung forward. Vitiate grabbed Dooku's blade that was in the process of jabbing at him and immediately took the curved weapon, brought it around his back, and dried it across Windu's chest in all one swift one motion. Dooku and Windu were dead instantaneously, and Vitiate watched as clones and droids were all torn apart in front of him. Vitiate waited for every last clone trooper to be killed, every last droid to be executed, every last vehicle to be crushed before he routed the troops from Ryloth. The dropships came and the entire Sith army packed up and left for the far side of the planet. When the remaining troops of the 187th and the droid legions came to the ground, they found what seemed to be a massive battle. Without confirmation of what happened, the Republican Separatists dug their heels in and the conflict began again between two foes. The Separatist fleet would be destroyed by the Republic fleet, barely. As for the ground battle, it would be won by the clones, but the heartache of having to watch and see what had happened, the deaths of so many, would haunt them forever, until they returned to what little of a fleet they had left. The sight was tragic, and the news that came out of Ryloth was even more so. A Republic victory, but genocide on the hands of the Separatists. There was no sign of the Sith armies. The truth is, their assault of the citizens and the ambush of the clones and droids left so few casualties of their own men that they weren't able to identify any Sith members found under the rubble of the destruction. The Sith Emperor would depart into hyperspace again. He realized one thing was true. It was a fact that these times had changed. New vessels, new vehicles, new droids, and the Jedi looked a little bit different, and from his little perception, the Jedi and the Sith were working together. What a weird time it was for the Sith Emperor to show up in. But he decided that he would have to be more careful. There was a much larger army out in the galaxy, and while the Sith army had the advantage of surprise, they wouldn't always have this advantage. Telling Vitiate that he had to strategize correctly, Lord Vitiate would send Arcane, Thexan, and Valen out into the galaxy to gain a perception of what was really at play here. It was completely undercover. They would be integral to Vitiate's plans for galactic domination. See, Vitiate didn't just want power, he wanted absolute control. His most loyal men were loyal to him because he used the force to manipulate their minds into being so. His sons were very similar in their treatment as they were also told by the force to trust and be loyal to their father. This is because Vitiate was the most powerful Sith before Sidious came around. Though the one troubling thing for Vitiate was the Chosen One, which he didn't know existed in this era. It would be for a couple of months out in the Outer Rim, floating around in an asteroid belt near the Maul, but the first of three sons would arrive. Arcane reported to the father that there was a clone war currently taking place. He also mentioned that the few planets he visited were a part of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Since the fall of Ryloth, the Confederacy was having a difficult time politically without Count Dooku. Arcane assumed that Dooku was the elder man that Vitiate killed on Ryloth. 
Arkane also told his father that it seemed as if militaristically, the CIS was able to continue in its ways without Dooku. It was just a political mess without him. Vishiet was appreciative for his information. Within the next two weeks, Thex and Valen would return to their father and inform him of the Republic situation and more of the rest of the Galactic situation. They would come to understand that more than a thousand years had passed since their trip to hyperspace. While they didn't have an answer for it, it was the fact that so much time had elapsed since their time period. It meant for Vitiate that he had a rival out in the galaxy. There had to be at least one other Sith in the galaxy that would challenge his authority. Vitiate knew he needed to take advantage of the galactic conflict so that he could seize his own power. The ships from the old era weren't going to be strong enough to hold their own against the Republic or the Confederacy. The ground battle was something they could actually sustain, but space combat would be the result of their death. So Vitiate had to play this safe. Valen made Vitiate aware of the Republic's poster boy. His name was Anakin Skywalker. Vitiate was confused as to why Valen would bring this to his attention. Vitiate's son told him that maybe Skywalker was powerful, considering he was one of three Jedi propped up in Republic propaganda. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka were the other two, often depicted behind Anakin on these Republic posters. Vishier told his children not to pay attention to propaganda. The figures were just props for the war machine. They should remember that those with the most power are the humble ones in their abilities, with no need to be propped up on a billboard for the galaxy to see. While Vitiate might be right about personal imagery in terms of fake personas, Anakin wasn't promoting himself. He was a victim of the machine Palpatine was building around him, Palpatine being the only other Sith Lord in the galaxy that Vitiate would have to worry about. The sons asked their father what his plans were. Vitiate noted that the Outer Rim seemed to be the weakest link to the Republic, and if what Thexen said about the fall of Genosis, then the Republic would be making its way out of the Outer Rim. Near planets like Tatooine, Hypori, and Nalhutta would be perfect targets. The sons didn't really catch the drift. Vitiate wanted to drag the propaganda boys and girl out to face him, where he could destroy them on his own playing field. Vitiate's plan revolved around the Republic being dumb enough to chase after him, though Arcane suggested that his father find the droid foundries that belonged to the Separatists, because the Separatists had a much more advanced and much larger army than the Republic. Vitiate looked at his son with a deadly glare, to which his son backed down. Vitiate sighed, telling Arcane that if he wanted to stop the Separatists, then the three of them would have to go out and sabotage each of their factories individually. If their strategic knowledge would be impactful in this new era, then they might as well capitalize off of it. Vitiate, on the other hand, would continue with his plan to eradicate the Outer Rim, starting with the world of Tatooine. Unbeknownst to the Sith Emperor, the Republican Confederacy were working towards peace. Sidious was trying to stop it because of what happened at Ryloth. Especially with the death of Dooku, people were anxious, hence the reason for the peace talks. While there were reports that a third party was involved, most of the galaxy just knew that the entire Twi'lek population on Ryloth was wiped out. While there were still Twi'leks across the galaxy, the overall population was completely eradicated on the planet. Cities worked hard to deter the Republic and the Separatists, which was kind of working, more or less being put to a vote while the war continued to drag on. Vitiate would divide his armies up three times, sending one army to Tatooine, with him, one to Hypori, and another to Nalhutta to eradicate the crime lords. Vitiate believed his army was satisfactory, so none of the pirates would be spared. Every living being was to be eradicated on sight. It didn't matter. Each of these three planets would burn, and burn they did. Because of how far in the Outer Rim these planets were, no one within the Republic would hear about it for weeks. The Separatists wouldn't hear about it at all, either. But because the Republic discovered the wreckage of the Outer Rim, which had expanded from Hypori, Tatooine, and Nalhutta, all the way to Zygeria, Udapal, Alzok, Dathomir, Dikar, Sullust, Genosis, Rhodia, and all the way up to Naboo. Luckily for Palpatine and Senator Amidala, they were currently not on their homeworld to watch their planet burn to the ground with the deaths of the Gungans and the people of Theed. With minimal interaction with the Republic on this campaign, the Sith army would be taken to Korriban with little to no casualties. As for the Suns, they had been rather successful in sabotaging the Separatists. On the other side of the galaxy, the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious, decided to take leave of absence. There was something larger at play here, and so he traveled to the darkest planet in the galaxy to tap into the dark side of the Force to find out where all this darkness was coming from. When he arrived at Korriban, he found a fleet. 
Sinise's ship didn't appear on their radars because of the size of the vessel and because of its different functioning frequency than the older vessels. Sidious was fortunate enough to sneak down onto the planet of where he saw the Sith Temple that had been fully reconstructed. It had been ruins forever, but now it was pristine. Sidious decided to sneak in further. He could feel the darkness like he'd never felt before on the planet. On the inside of the temple, four men walked out towards the entrance. Vitiate could feel the presence of another Sith, and he walked out to investigate to find out who it might be. Though, when he and his sons exited the temple, they were spotted by Sidious. He couldn't believe it. Vitiate was one of Sidious's heroes, and there was something more. Vitiate is the only being in the galaxy other than Skywalker that Sidious could ever fear. Well, unluckily for Vitiate, he could feel Sidious's fear. He looked over and locked eyes with Darth Sidious. Palpatine had two choices, run or fight, and so he ran. Vitiate told his sons not to chase after Sidious. He was going to bring the fight to him, and then they would crush any resistance to their rule. The sons understood and watched as Sidious' ship departed and eventually exited into hyperspace. Sidious sat inside of his ship through hyperspace. He needed a plan. He knew he couldn't take on Vitiate alone. And the only two people with enough power to even fight Vitiate was Skywalker, Yoda, or just himself. Sidious needed a plan, because he wasn't going to bow down to Vitiate. That was the thing. Sidious was a Sith, and the Sith didn't bow down to other Sith. Sidious wouldn't allow someone else to just walk all over his plan. Vitiate was the biggest threat to him, so Sidious had to come up with a plan that sounded good on paper. It involved the clone army, it involved Skywalker, and it involved something he couldn't even say aloud because it made him so sick to his stomach. It involved the help of the Jedi. Sidious knew this would be a risky plan, but it could be worth a shot, because he had no other options. If Sidious allowed the Jedi to handle this, Sidious wouldn't have a galaxy to take over. So many planets were completely wiped off the map, trillions were dead, and entire populations in disarray. Palpatine certainly needed to take notes from one of the best, but he couldn't do that if Vitiate was alive long enough to destroy everything he wanted to take over. The other issue is that the Separatists were currently in a little bit of trouble. Most of their factories weren't functioning, or self-destructed when conveyor belts or other important infrastructure pieces exploded from the inside. With millions of droids gone and the rest of their army spread out across the galaxy, he couldn't really just use the Separatists to take on Vitiate, considering how well that worked for Dooku on Ryloth, so the risk would be taken when he arrived on Coruscant. Sidious would wait till morning and request the Jedi Council to his office. Yoda, Obi-Wan, Plo Koon, Depa Balaba, and Kit Fisto would arrive. Sidious would explain to them that he had a proposition, but they needed to be with it. The Jedi were confused, but Palpatine said he wanted them to team up with him. The Jedi were at an obvious loss, until Palpatine revealed that he was a Sith Lord. The Jedi nearly jumped to their feet, but they listened to hear what he had to say. They were Jedi, after all. Had Windu been there, it may have been a little bit of a different situation, with a little bit less patience, but he wasn't. Sidious explained that somehow one of the ancient Sith had returned. Sidious expressed that in the ancient Sith lore, Vitiate was last seen heading towards the Outer Rim before never being seen again, with all of his armies disappearing. Though he was now with his army, here, back from the past. They were at the height of their power, and Sidious had always believed that Vitiate would have wiped out the Republic and the Jedi had he not disappeared. Yoda asked why Sidious thought they would help. Sidious expressed that Vitiate was the most powerful Sith the galaxy had ever seen. He came after the Triumvirate, and he was after the Jedi's own Revan. While Yoda and Plo were the only two in the room who knew who Revan was, Sidious's knowledge of history is what made him such a genius. Plo Koon begged the question why Sidious would rather kill Vitiate than team up with him. Sidious snickered. If he wanted to rule the galaxy, then having someone as equally powerful around was a threat. Vitiate was a rival, and Sidious would thrive without him. Not to mention, if Vitiate continued, then Sidious wouldn't have a galaxy to rule. To an extent, the Jedi understood where Palpatine was coming from, but being that he was a Sith, there had to be something else, there had to be a catch to this. Sidious told the Jedi that he would have to train Skywalker. The Jedi were confused, and then Palpatine expressed that if Anakin was the chosen one, then he would have the opportunity to succeed in his destiny. Obi-Wan was outraged at the idea, but the council members present found this to be reasonable, and so they agreed. The Jedi and the Sith would unite to take down a common enemy, a more powerful Sith. They would bring Anakin off of the front lines and back to Coruscant. 
with the Clone War still raging on, the Jedi would begin moving their fleets out to the Outer Rim, cutting off hyperspace routes surrounding Korriban, even the Hidden Ones, information provided by Palpatine of course. For a couple of months, Anakin would reluctantly work with Palpatine, but also train with Yoda. Now in reality, this sounded really bad for Sidious, but he had it all figured out. The Jedi doubted him, and he would use his training time with Skywalker to try and turn him to the dark side, just enough that he would join. The plan would be enacted when the clone armies and the Jedi were on Korriban. Sidious would use Executive Order 66 to wipe out the Jedi present, and then he would bring the clones back to Coruscant to finish the job. On paper, this plan worked really well. It was just a matter of finding out if Sidious could successfully pull this off, which at the moment looked to be the case. Anakin was trained to be the highest level by both avatars of the light and the dark, pushing Anakin into a direction of consistent struggle. Palpatine was very forceful, and yet Yoda, on the other hand, was very nurturing. Skywalker through this would excel unlike ever before, tapping into the true power of the Force itself, not just light or dark, but balance. Vishid, on the other hand, knew something was coming, so he planned accordingly for it. Scouts informed him of all the fleets around Korriban, so the entire planet was rigged with traps, meant to rip the Republic and Sidious apart. Vitiate didn't fear Sidious, which is why he allowed his biggest fan to prepare to fail. It would simply work perfectly for Vitiate because all he would have to do is successfully defend Korriban, and then from there he could march his armies out across the galaxy and burn it to the ground. After months, Sidious, Skywalker, and 200 of the Jedi's best warriors would accompany four legions of clones to Korriban, the 501st leading the charge with the 212th Galactic Marines and the 327th Scar Corps backing them up. The 7th Sky Corps was also present, but they traveled with the 212th anyways. The trip through hyperspace was tense. Everyone knew it was on the line. This was a fight for the soul of the galaxy, a fight for justice and peace, and for Sidious it was a fight for his right to the rule of the galaxy that he believed belonged to him. When they arrived outside of Korriban with the collection of the Republic's best, Admiral Yularen would direct Captain Tarkin to the left with his group of Venators, and on the other side, Captain Ozel. The fleet battle was brilliant. The old ships of the Sith Empire stood no chance, even against the Venators. A thousand plus years of time since these ships saw active combat, and definitely not outfitted with the appropriate turbo lasers or shields to handle this velocity. It was like melting metal under hot liquid magma. The Sith fleet was really just a decoy though. Vitiate knew that it wouldn't stand up to the modern technology. With an unscrewed fleet destroyed, the Republic shot their gunships to the rubble escorted by Jedi starfighters. Yoda stood in a gunship next to Skywalker, and then to his right was Palpatine. Behind him was Captain Rex. The gunships faced no flag, which for gunship pilots was one of the few landing procedures where they were guaranteed survival. The turnover rate for gunship pilots was awful, unless you had a Jedi in the ship with you. Regardless, when they landed, the clones got out and searched the area. The temple was beautiful, to all those with edgy tastes at least. It was dark and glowing with the pride of the Sith. Sidious told the Jedi that they needed to spread out. While the Jedi weren't inclined to trust Sidious, they were aware that the Sith liked ambushes. While Sidious was making a strategically sound plan for victory for himself, he was also making a plan for Order 66 to work as best as it possibly could. The Jedi split up, with the 501st and 212th going to the right and the Galactic Marines and the 327th going left. It was eerily silent. Everyone was on edge. The movement of clones and the Jedi together was magnificent. This was a larger show of strength since Genosis. Sidious, Skywalker, Kenobi, Yoda, and Plo Koon moved together. This was one thing Sidious couldn't change. He was required to be escorted by this group. It's okay. Once Order 66 was executed, Anakin would be in his grasps. Silence would be interrupted as a mountain surrounding the Sith Temple would open up and from the inside a firing line ran out, crushing through the clone ranks of both sides. The clones and the Jedi were out in the open with nowhere to hide, nowhere to take cover. The Sith had trapped him. Sidious and Skywalker worked quickly when the mountain opened up, while the rest of the Jedi quickly ignited their lightsabers to defend their troopers. Anakin and Sidious raised their hands and crushed the support beams. Valen, who was with the Sith troops, watched the beams crumble and then he raised his hand to prevent the mountain from collapsing on him and his troops. Skywalker used the force to propel a stray blaster bolt through Valen's throat, dropping him as the mountain slammed down on top of the troops inside of the bunker. On the other side, the clones and the Jedi were being massacred. Skywalker ordered the 501st to go assist them. 
Kenobi requested the 212th to follow the 501st. A massive group of Jedi followed the two legions, while Skywalker, Kenobi, Plo Koon, Sidious, Depa Bilaba, Kit Fisto, Yoda, and Shakti ran into the temple itself. Inside of the temple, sitting before the throne of Vitiate, Thexan and Arcan stood at attention. Their father didn't move a muscle. The two sons ignited their lightsabers and ran forward. The Jedi responded with their own moves. Sidious grabbed Anakin's forearm and told him to wait. Anakin took at Sidious with a hiss in his stare. Anakin put his metallic hand over Sidious' wrist, telling him that if he thought he would rather be anywhere than just right here with his friends and in the rule of Sith, then he was wrong. Sidious watched Anakin break his grip and then run into battle. Kit Fisto, Shakti, and Depa took Archon, while Plo and Kenobi took on Thexen. Yoda and Anakin ignited their lightsabers and walked up towards Vitiate. He watched their movements without moving. His two sons were instantaneously killed in a tough combat. Sidious, Depa, Shakti, Fisto, Yoda, Plo, Kenobi, and Skywalker all stood before Vitiate with their blades drawn. Vitiate didn't bat an eye as he slowly stood up and looked down at all of them. Without raising his hands, he closed his eyes, and the Force drew in the weakest of the bunch, which is really saying something because this was some of the best warriors the Jedi had to offer. Depa Balaba and Kit Fisto fell to their knees as the Force was pulled from their bodies, just like Windu and Dooku had. Luckily, the other Jedi were able to defend themselves from it. Kenobi and Plo Koon ran forward. Vitiate stepped down one step, raising one hand and force draining Obi-Wan before raising his other hand and shooting a volt of electricity into Plo's chest, throwing him off of his feet and down the stairs of the throne. Shakti ran to help Obi-Wan as she was lifted from her feet and force choked in the air. Before Yoda, Sidious, and Skywalker, they all stood before Vitiate with shock in their eyes. The Sith Emperor dropped Obi-Wan and Shakti. The two of them fell down to the ground, rolling before Fisto and Depa. Kenobi looked up. Anakin stood between Yoda and Sidious. He stared down Vitiate without budging. He stepped forward towards the Sith Emperor. Sidious looked at Vitiate. His skin crawled. Yoda, on the other hand, was ready to support Skywalker in defeating the Sith Emperor. Vitiate didn't hesitate as he pulled his dead son's lightsaber to his hands and ignited them. Anakin swung forward and knocked Vitiate off his feet. Yoda and Sidious leapt forward. Vitiate responded by pushing himself back and landing on his feet, driving his blade forward, almost cutting through Sidious. But he was quick enough to defend himself. Yoda jumped forward. Vitiate turned around and threw lightning at Yoda, throwing him down the stone stairs. Anakin pushed forward. Vitiate was like a blur. Without the training of Sidious or Yoda, Anakin would have been well gone. Skywalker fell back as his blades crossed with Vitiate. Their blades lit up the throne room. Sidious watched Anakin in his brilliance. Vitiate tried to pull the force from Skywalker, but inadvertently gave Skywalker more power. Anakin's swings got stronger and stronger, but he continued to fall back on a powerful retreat. At the bottom of the steps, Skywalker and Vitiate held their own. The Jedi all watched, either in pain or without the ability to use the force to help Anakin. Vitiate shot lightning at Sidious, who made his way down the steps. He blocked the lightning and lunged forward. Vitiate saw this coming from a million miles away to which he raised his blade and cut down the Sith Lord. Anakin watched, ignoring the traitor who befriended him die on the ground. Skywalker threw his blade forward, pushing Vitiate backwards. Plo Koon and Shock T rose as they swung at Vitiate. The brilliant Sith Emperor dropped down below them with their swings, cutting outwards, and took out the legs of one of them and the arm of another. Both Jedi fell back in pain as Anakin continued his assault, throwing his blade at Vitiate with ferocity, prowess, and precision. Vitiate began to show breaking in his strength, and then he swung Skywalker's blade out of his hand. Anakin didn't bat an eye. This was a defining moment for him. He stood in front of Vitiate without a lightsaber, and the Sith Emperor brought his blades around and slashed from both sides towards Anakin. Anakin moved his hands out and with the force caught both lightsabers in midair. The heat from the blades ran across Anakin's bare hand, but it didn't touch his skin. Anakin sheathed the lightsabers in Vitiate's hands with the force. The Sith Emperor had shock on his face, but he reacted with confidence, taking one last chance at Skywalker by trying to take his power from him. It didn't work. Anakin's force barrier was way too strong. Skywalker raised his hand and did the inverse of what Vitiate was trying to do to him. Skywalker threw so much energy within the force at the Sith Emperor, he overwhelmed his entire being with the power of the force. Vitiate couldn't hold on to the power of Skywalker and it shattered him. His entire body broke into pieces and exploded as he died. 
Skywalker looked down. The robes of the Sith Emperor's robes fell to the ground slowly, floating down into the dead air. Anakin took in a deep breath. The Jedi gathered around him. Anakin looked down and made sure that Sidious was dead as well, and then he helped up his dear old master Obi-Wan. Shocked he was missing a leg and Plo helped her up while he was missing an arm. Anakin looked around for Yoda and found him breathing heavily on the side of the steps of the throne. Anakin picked Yoda up and held him in his arms. Yoda smiled at Anakin, telling him that he had done it. He had brought balance to the Force. Anakin had a tear wallow in his eye, afraid to lose Master Yoda. No matter the discrepancies the two of them had, in the moment, after everything they had been through, this is what mattered. With the sounds of the battle dying outside the Sith Temple, Yoda was ready to pass into the Force. Anakin brought Yoda down in front of the other council members and, with a little chuckle, Yoda told the group of Jedi that the Force would always be with them. Instead of a solitary death in a physical form, Yoda was transported into the Force itself by the ghost of Qui-Gon Jinn. The Jedi would pick up the dead and memorialize those lost in the Battle of Korriban. The last of the Sith had been extinguished, and as for Maul, he would stay on the dump trash world he called home for the remainder of his miserable life. When the Jedi returned to Coruscant, they would reveal everything to the Senate and inform them of the monster that used to be the Chancellor of the Republic. The war would come to an end. The Council would move Anakin to a leading seat. While the Battle of Korriban had a lot of casualties, it would sow the end of the Sith. But not just for the Sith, but for the end of war in general. With several planets wiped off the galactic map, the second year of the Clone Wars would sign the end of war for generations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, and Gorf for supporting the channel. Hit down and likes on this video. If you like this video and you want to see more stuff with Legends continuity and stuff like that, if you want to see what if, let me know really in the comments want to cross over check out this, the Twitch, community Discord, and Patreon to support me in other ways. I got other channels. Go check them out. Go show them love. The Sauna Suit video, you guys have blown that up. Thank you so much. I put so much effort into the content I put out for you guys. And I love you guys so much. So thank you for showing continuous support on not just this channel, but on my other channels too. It means a whole lot to me. I got some other channels that are going to be showing up soon. I got the other two videos. I got two videos coming out for the other two channels coming out this weekend. So stay tuned for those. Uh, let's talk about our story here. Uh, also for the lightsaber, go down below. There's a doc. Click on the doc. You write your name on the doc and hit that subscribe button. I give away the lightsaber at 50,000 subscribers. Don't pay attention to that scammer. That's not me. I will announce video winaways winners in video. So obviously... Uh, I've done a story like this before, and the other story was a lot of fun, and I still want to do a mini-series off that. I've thought about doing that, so if you guys remember that video, the What If the Sith Empire Return, let me know and we can do a mini-series off of that. Um, or I might just pick another topic to do a mini-series off of, like a series kind of like The Clone Wars, where it's, you know, 30-minute episodes that have a lot of writing about characters and, you know, maybe dialogue. I don't know yet, but, you know, something that... May, might be fun for uh, for a small community to rally behind something that's a lot of fun. Uh, let me know what you think about that though. And um, so let's talk about this story in particular. Uh, and this this story is a lot of the irony of the Sith, the Sith being destroyed by their own lust for power, and that's the battle between Sidious and Vitiate. It's the irony of the Sith, how the, the Sith just can't work. They live in spite of themselves, and I think that's what I wanted to portray here, because uh, Sidious couldn't ever ever live with someone as powerful as Vitiate surrounding him or being around him or just being anywhere in the galaxy. He just couldn't. He couldn't stand that. It would just drive him nuts because the like, Vitiate is powerful and that's something I wanted to make sure. I wanted to pay homage to Vitiate because he's a really powerful dude and um, that's something I found out when I was doing research for this video and I wanted to keep it true to that character arc. Um, now, I wanted to do something interesting here. I didn't want to do a copy copy of what I did last time, so I opened up a wormhole, something something stupid like that, something just to get them there without making it seem like a complete ex machina where they just showed up from, you know, the DeLorean or something. I just wanted them to be like, okay, so that's how you get there. Um, and I wanted the story to convey the maturity and change in my writing since the last time we did something like this. Um, and this one is a lot less far-fetched and a lot more grounded and I hope it's much more enjoyable because of that. I'm not saying the other one wasn't enjoyable but I wanted this one to feel a lot more grounded because the last one I was kind of throwing up ideas and I was like I don't really know a lot about the Sith Empire and stuff like that so I could just kind of throw Nihilus in there with Revan and make it make sense and this one I wanted to focus on Vitiate returning and the fact and the the, the difference he would have. Now 
uh, Vitiate was very confident and I wanted that portrayed and I wanted that shown with his first interaction with Dooku and Windu where he doesn't even ignite a lightsaber, he just kills him with the force, like he is just magnificent, he uses his intuition, he uses his power, he uses his confidence to just overwhelm them. And I wanted Vitiate to seem impossibly, impossible to beat. And the 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 thing about this story is I wanted this story to also originally I wasn't at the bad guys one. Again, a lot of these stories I, I I say this a lot. A lot of these stories have a much different ending when I start writing them, and then as I develop the story, it just doesn't end like that because naturally it wouldn't make sense for that particular ending to happen. And in this story. I, I really I really was like, okay, well, Vitiate's gonna win. And then at the next point, I was like, oh, Sidious is gonna win. And then at the end of it, I was like, oh, wait, it's Anakin. Anakin's gonna be the chosen one. It makes perfect sense. And uh, that's what I wanted to convey at the very end, is that that while Vitiate and while Sidious are incredible, if, if Anakin was trained by both the Avatar of the Light and the Avatar of the Dark, he would become more than just the chosen one. He would be unstoppable. And just a couple months of that training, I think that would show heavily in this point and this is before you know this is before obi-wan becomes ranko hardeen this is before ahsoka gets kicked out of the order so he might have some discrepancies with the jedi but he's not being you know abused by mace windu anymore he is literally perfectly fine he is he is doing well in the jedi order so he has no reason to want to betray them and that anakin is unstoppable. He's not siding with Sidious. He's not taking Sidious to side in anything, and he's really sticking to his guns. He's gonna say, no, I'm a Jedi. You know, not like I'm a Jedi, but like my father before me, it's I'm a Jedi. Um, and the open-endedness of this video is more or less, you know, imagine what happens. Does Anakin have his children? Does he bring a new era of the Jedi Order? What, what does that detail? And that's up for you to determine. You know, that's a lot of the reason why I leave these stories open-ended. It's like, I don't want a sequel. I want you to have fun with the imagination that comes with Star Wars because Star Wars is truly remarkable and Star Wars is why these videos are possible. And why I leave most of these videos without a part two, unless it's an intended or planned part one through part three or part two or whatnot, um, I leave them open-ended because I want you to have fun with the imagination that I've given you from my imagination. You get to take a story that I've written and run with it, and that's the beauty of Star Wars. It's like poetry, it just rhymes, and George is a massive inspiration to that because while he finished off Return of the Jedi, and that was his finale to the Star Wars saga, it leaves so much open for you to take in, so much more for you to think about. And even if he had done a sequel trilogy, that's the same thing he would have done. He wouldn't have just finished it. There would have felt like there's more to be told, something that you still want to see, something that's laying behind the story that he told in the Skywalker saga. And that's that's the inspiration for the ending of these stories. And I think I hope that I was able to accomplish that with this video, um, and this was a lot of fun because I don't get to work with Legends characters as often, uh, and, you know, it's always fun to throw in a Legends character, make him scary, you know? I always work with Palpatine, that's something I've talked about in the past before, where it's always hard coming with something new for Palpatine, you know? I've had to write Palpatine's death at least a hundred times, and I always try to make it unique, and having someone like Vitiate come in and be the main bad guy, be that guy that you have to fear, makes me have so much more fun writing it, because I get to have so much more fun, I get to do something different that you haven't seen before, that hasn't been seen, not just only in my videos, but across the community. So, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.